Today we're discussing how to write the middle of a story, perhaps the hardest part. So we all know that the beginning of a story is about setting up the character's desire, at least in a story where we're going to be pushing forward the audience with dramatic tension. And the end of a story is about the resolution, where we find out did the character get what they wanted or not. But what happens in the middle? I mean, it's the largest chunk of the story, and there's perhaps the least advice about what goes in that area. So the short answer is that the middle is where the character enacts their plan. The character has the desire from the beginning of the story, and then the middle is where they take what they know and they start making mistakes and they learn. John Truby talks about in his book, The Anatomy of Story, how a story is this sort of pendulum swing between learning and acting. And a character will try something, they'll act, and then they'll find out why they're wrong or why the problem is different than they thought it was. And then they'll have to recalibrate and through that process they learn and they come up with a new plan and they act again. And that's the short answer of what goes in the middle. But that doesn't mean that we're going to have an easy time with the middle just because we know that a character has to enact a plan. So what are some things that we can do to make it easier for us to write the middle of a story? The short answer is we need to ensure that our story has structural opposition. So that means that there essentially is someone or something, some force, that's opposing the desire of the character. The character wants something and something is going to be standing in their way. Uh, easy to say, right? But sometimes harder to do than it may seem because there are some things that we can put in a character's way that a character can just go around. And if that's the case, it won't be believable if the character is struggling for 50% of the story uh, when they could just go around it. Like, this obstacle or this opposition has to be real. It has to actually be stopping the character. So this is where antagonism comes in, where generally, a single antagonist character comes in. Now there are also stories where you could have the main character or the protagonist who acts as their own antagonist. And this is the case when the protagonist perhaps has some sort of moral flaw that's holding them back and that's preventing them from getting what they want. But also in those stories where we have an antagonist, we have a character, they can act as opposition. Now in this case, this is called dramatic opposition. When you have some force that stands in direct opposition of what the protagonist wants. Drama is about desire, it's about wanting. Theme is a little more ethereal than that. Uh, it's about what the best way to live life is, essentially. So we need to have that dramatic opposition and have that opponent that's going to stand in the way of what the character wants. So how do we make sure that the opposition is structural in nature? How do we make sure that the opposition isn't going to just disappear or that uh, one of the characters is going to get what they want and then the other one just doesn't really care? Or <laughs> the antagonist can figure out a different way to get it and it's no big deal. So the short answer to this, how we ensure that two characters are going to be in structural opposition, is to ensure that they're going after the same thing, that they want control of the same thing. This is the key, that they're vying for control of the same thing, and that they both have different visions of what to do once they have control of that thing. So the example that I like to give here is this opposition between perhaps a uh, detective and a criminal. So what are they actually fighting for? They're actually fighting for the truth that the justice system will believe and that the public will believe. And so uh, the, the detective wants the real truth. They want control of the truth and they want the real truth. The criminal wants control of the truth, but they want a false truth. They want a facade. They want manipulation and deception. So they're both vying for control over what's considered the truth, but they both have different plans on what to do once they gain control of that truth. It's the same with uh, like a policeman and, and a criminal. What are they vying for? They're vying for the freedom of the criminal. They both want the same thing. 
uh, they just have different plans on what to do once they get control of it, right? So the policeman wants to wants control of the criminal's freedom and wants to incarcerate them, or you know, prosecute. And the criminal wants control of the freedom and wants to let themselves go, right? So we also see this in The Dark Knight Rises, where the um, where Batman and the Joker are in opposition with each other. What are they vying for control over? It's the soul of Gotham. That's what they want. And they both have different plans on what to do with Gotham, like what the soul of Gotham is and what direction it should go in. So that's how we create this dramatic opposition. And for anyone who just joined, we are discussing how to create dramatic opposition in a story. We're discussing how to write the middle of a story which is this, generally this elusive thing where uh, not much advice is given on how to write the middle of a story, but it's also the largest section of a story, so it's pretty important to know what to do. And the short answer is that a character needs to enact their plan during the middle of a story, but we need to make sure that we have the building blocks to make sure that that is easy to write, essentially. So we need to ensure that we have that dramatic opposition. We need to ensure that we have the antagonist, which might be a character or it might be within the protagonist themselves, such as in Finding Nemo, where the character is essentially self-sabotaging. And after we have the dramatic opposition, we also generally want to have a thematic opposition or a an opposition to the protagonist's worldview or the way that they think the that life should be lived. Now sometimes this thematic opponent is the same as the dramatic opponent, and sometimes they're different. So in in Toy Story, the dramatic opponent is Buzz, because he stands in the way of what Woody wants, although he's not intentionally doing so. He's also the thematic opponent because he has a different worldview about what it means to be a toy. Um, in Finding Nemo, Dory is the is the thematic opponent. She has a different worldview and a different approach to life than Marlon does. She thinks we can just let things go. Marlon thinks you have to hold on to them tightly. But Dory is not Marlon's dramatic opponent. She doesn't stand in the way of what Marlon wants. In fact, Dory is an ally to Marlon in his quest to find Nemo. Who is the antagonist in Finding Nemo? I would argue that it is uh, Marlon himself. He's There are episodic opponents as well, but Marlon's really the one who stands in his own way with his moral weakness. All right, so you got to make sure that you have that opposition. You got to make sure it's dramatic. You got to make sure it's thematic, because if we can set characters in opposition to each other in the way that they view life and the way that they think things should be done, they're more likely to clash when it comes to what the protagonist wants and stopping the protagonist from getting what it is that they want. It's way more interesting if uh, the detective and the criminal have a difference in world view than if they're just, you know, it's just a day on the job. It's way more interesting if it's, if there are approaches to life that are on the line, like what I believe is on the line. That's way more interesting as far as the story goes. Okay, so right in the middle of a story, we have to make sure that that opposition is there. So once the character has a desire, which is what the first bit of the story is about, act one traditionally, then they're going to enact their plan to go after that desire. So plans, let's talk about this. Plans, uh, every character tends to have a different strategy for how they enact their plans. The main difference between a hero and a villain is that a villain believes that, generally, that anything can be done to go after what I want. In other words, that the ends are worth any means. Whereas, a protagonist or a hero will say there are some lines that I won't cross. And so not, you know, not anything is worth it. I won't kill, I won't steal, I won't do these immoral things. So that's one of the central differences between a hero and a villain. And if we think about that, that is that the hero and the villain have fundamentally different strategies in how they enact their plan. So if we're looking at the different strategies, we could generally break them down into three, maybe four categories. Uh, we can break those down to subcategories, obviously, but the first one is persuasion. Characters who go after what they want in the moral way, 
They try to sell the benefit. They try to convince others what they need. They might use logic. They might use logos, pathos, ethos, right? They might appeal to authority. They might appeal to emotion. They might even guilt trip, right? That That's not necessarily manipulation if it's the truth. Um, persuasion, it might be charm. These are generally moral things on the whole. It's a gray area, right? You can, you can, <laughs> you can be immoral in persuasion, especially if you're making up things or uh, obscuring the facts. So that's one area. And then the second area of how a character may enact their plan through strategy is manipulation and deception. And this is where a character starts to get loose with the truth. They might intentionally make things up or they might just not include facts that are relevant to the situation. They might conceal their identity. This is where strategies like Trojan horse uh, strategies come into play, where you approach someone offering a gift or something of value when it's actually a trap. Um, ambushes, just verbal wordplay, trying to get someone to admit something uh, through immoral means. Uh, they're, you know, spying. Uh, also a bunch of, a bunch of different techniques with like military techniques, essentially, and, and intelligence techniques uh, with communication. And uh, there was a great one in uh, El... Gosh, the... Was it called El Camino? The, the newest Breaking Bad one with Jesse as the main character of the story. So he wanted to get something from his parents' house. So we called up his parents and basically started saying how sorry he was and asking for forgiveness, and he asked them to meet him at a location. So we were like, oh, okay, he's, you know, he's repenting, essentially. But, you know, this isn't great, because he's probably going to be caught, uh, he's probably going to be caught at this moment. But it turns out that was just a facade. He was deceiving, he was manipulating, he wanted to get his parents out of the house so that he could go in there and get something, I think, from their safe. So... That's where manipulation and deception comes in. And then thirdly, the final strategy that a character may have is coercion. And this is essentially violence. This includes blackmail or the threat of violence. Blackmail, extortion, uh, obviously coercion, uh, just straight violence and aggression. Um, that's all that falls into there. So a lot of the villains act in the area of manipulation and deception and coercion. A lot of the heroes act in the area of persuasion. And then over the course of the story, over the course of the middle of this story particularly, a character may fall to what's called the paradox of animosity, which is where a character realizes that, you know what, if I'm going to overcome this villain, I'm going to have to change up my ways. Like, I have to fight fire with fire. The only way to overcome this terrible person is for me to do morally questionable things. Some characters will justify their actions and their strategies in that way. It's a rationale. And so they'll essentially fall from a strategy of persuasion to a strategy of deception and manipulation, and sometimes even to coercion if they can justify it to themselves. So a character strategy doesn't have to stay the same over the course of the story. So a character has a plan uh, that they start with at the, at the end of Act 1, essentially once they've got their desire, and then they enact it using one of their strategies. So another key thing when writing the middle of a story is that there's something happens that something that happens in the dead center of the story called appropriately the midpoint. And it's at this point generally that the hero's problem starts to come into full view. They start to realize just what they're up against. And so this implies of course that the first half of the middle that the hero doesn't quite understand what they're up against. In in fact they're a little bit naive. They think that, well, if they just enact this plan really quickly, that they'll be home by dinner. Um, Matt Bird's book, The Secrets of Story, has some great stuff in it about this in particular. And they say, you know, if I enact this, it's going to be fantastic, and uh, there's not a problem. I'm not up against anything I haven't met before, right? But then, as they continue to do that, and they may get a few successes, and they may start to feel confident about themselves, or they may find out that what they're doing is just not working, at the midpoint, something tends to happen that's terrible, generally, not necessarily, but terrible, and that sets them back and makes them realize that the problems that you had are uh, nothing compared to what you're going to face. This is way more difficult than you thought. 
And that's a huge part of the middle of the story, which creates the second half of the middle, which then makes it so that the character has to approach the problem in a fundamentally new way. They have to come up with some new plan and usually some new strategy. And that's where that's an important part of the middle of a story. So we can break up the middle of a story to these second these two halves. All right, Katie's got a question here. What about repetitive middle story? I feel Stranger Things repeated the climax when the problem was solved. I was wondering, how do you avoid repeating a climax in the middle? What makes it stronger? Yeah, this is such a great point, Katie. Uh, so the, a couple of thoughts here for not writing a repeating story. John Truby talks about how the great sin of plotting, which is the great sin of storytelling in general, is repeating the same beat. What does that mean exactly? It means essentially showing the character, excuse me, showing the audience, and essentially, essentially the character, the same thing twice. We always want to be providing fundamentally new information and fundamentally new situations. And so to your point, you don't want a character, this is where a story can start to feel episodic. If they're coming across the same type of obstacle or the same type of confrontation over and over and over. And yeah, it could be wrapped in different skin. It might, you know, they might be fighting a dragon in this half. They might be fighting an ogre in this half and then fighting a wizard in this half, right? But what's the same basic action that a character is taking in all of those confrontations? It might be fighting, essentially. Now, we're not learning anything fundamentally new in this example that I'm giving. And so the problem with that is that it can make us feel like the story is not progressing. It can make us feel like the story is a laundry list for the protagonist. This is essentially, or especially the case when a character is sent on some mission. Like, you know what, you, I will help you, but you gotta go get this thing from this guy, and you gotta go heal this thing from that guy, and you gotta go do this thing from that guy. And you know the character's not going to fail on their their mission, so they, we just have to wait for an hour and a half, if we're watching a movie or something, while they go through this laundry list. And that can be terribly boring. So the answer to this is to ensure that we're providing fundamentally new beats. What's the way to do that? This is a difficult thing, but one of the techniques is to don't, don't be afraid of letting your character win. Or... Letting your character actually lose. Like, I know a lot of the times when we have a character lose and they fail at getting what they want, it's like, yeah, they're down and out, but they'll be back. Something will happen where they'll figure out there's a new way they can actually get this thing. Don't do that. Just let them fail and know it's gone. The thing that they wanted is actually gone. There is 0% chance they can have it again. And when that's the case, we have to come up with some new direction for the story. And uh, this is where sequels and interludes come in, where we can think of the story, uh, think of how a character would emotionally react to that. If they had some devastating loss that lost the thing that they truly wanted and it were truly gone, how would they emotionally react? What other desires might come about in that situation? Or let the character actually win. Pugolino was talking about this in the... Uh, the sequence approach, where there was this movie where the character wanted something and he got it at like the, I don't know, like 30% through the story. And uh, a lesser storyteller perhaps would have said, okay, how do we take this desire and stretch it out so that we last, in this case it's a screenplay, so that we last the full length of the screenplay. But no, just do whatever is organic and let the hero win or lose, and then figure out what organically comes out of that afterward, while keeping in mind that we don't want them to have to face the exact same confrontation or the same obstacle. So that's a great question, Katie, and it's tough uh, if we're not looking at, it's, it's tough because we're talking abstractly here. Um, if we want to speak in more detail or something, we can definitely do that. For Stranger Things, if you're talking about the newest season, I didn't finish it, unfortunately. Uh, so I'd have a hard time going into the details on that. Uh, Hydra says, not sure if this is on topic, but what are some of your favorite ways to brainstorm ideas? Oh, totally. Okay, 
Uh, I would love to talk about this. And then we'll finish up how to write the middle of a story. And nothing's off topic. I appreciate you all being here and asking all these great questions. So if you have any more questions, please ask them below. And thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ben, for joining. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Kumar. And thank you, Hydra. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Uh, greatly appreciate it. So ideas for brainstorming or methods for brainstorming. <sighs> Okay, one of the, my favorite ones that I've come across recently, or today even, is to think in terms of a metaphor. In fact, I think I'm gonna do a post about this tomorrow, where when we're brainstorming a character, we think about that character from a metaphor first. So if I'm coming up with a character, I might first choose something like a firework, and then think, okay, how could a character be like a firework? Well, they might be, explosive but also beautiful and I, so that would be something that I might pick for uh, a character and that would give me some insight into the character's actions and perhaps their uh, soul essentially and we might think of what about a greenhouse could a character be stuffy uh, but also conducive to growth and to nurturing so that's one of my favorite things recently. John Truby talks about this too. Uh, I'm a huge John Truby fan, in case you couldn't tell. He talks about this too with coming up with a setting or a story world. Think about what's the metaphor for the setting. So it could be a mountain. It could be a... And it doesn't have to be actually a mountain. It could just be a metaphor for a mountain or the ocean. He talks about how Mary Poppins is a metaphor for the ocean, that story world, in, a, in an odd way because Mary Poppins comes and she makes the children realize that the world is not two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional in a, you know, in an, imagina in an imagination sense, but also in a physical sense. She can go up and down with her umbrella and she shows them that the world, you can explore the world uh, in different ways, just like an ocean, just like Ocean animals can go in three dimensions, whereas we tend to, most of the time, be stuck in two dimensions. So, okay, metaphors. Uh, other things, I just love going on Pinterest and looking up images to spark my imagination. Um, Kingo has a thesaurus, kingo.com slash thesaurus, K-I-I-N-G-O.com. And I love to go on there and just go down the rabbit hole of thesaurus words, like pick firework, search it, and look at all the related words and look for metaphors in terms of that. I love to go on Wikipedia and use the random article button. That's one of my favorites too. Oh, such interesting things on Wikipedia. That I mean, most of the stuff is just like somebody's biography. All those, those can be really interesting depending on the person. Or like a place, which again can be interesting. But some of the times you get some really strange events or mysteries that came up. So I love Wikipedia for that as well. Um, some other brainstorming tools. I've been really digging some AI tools recently. I've been working on programming this thing that uh, gives you, that uses AI, uses a neural network to create story prompts. And that's really been helping me brainstorm as well. So a bunch of different techniques for that. Um, I also come up with worksheets that are more uh, for the outliner, so that they're more analytical, and they're kind of a checklist that you can go through. There's a bunch of different techniques, too, for this thing called conceptual blending, where you take two things, you take their salient properties, and you consider what would the two things be as a whole. And that's an interesting technique. Just look up conceptual blending. Uh, by association, there's a bunch of cool stuff. So hopefully that answers that. I'm gonna continue with uh, doing the middle of a story, right in the middle of the story. If any of you all have any more questions, though, please leave it below. I would love to discuss. All right, so we've got a character. We've got the midpoint where something happens that makes them realize that this is a, uh, that the, the problem that they face is much more difficult than they thought. And so the first half of the middle of the story is generally a naive approach to the problem. The second half is generally a more advanced approach, or at least the character understands what they're up against. The true power and complexity of the, of the antagonist's plan gens tends to come into focus at the midpoint of the story, at about the 50% mark. Uh, 
So that's another reason why it's so important. Uh, so I talked briefly about splitting the middle up into two sections, this first half and second half. And sometimes this is called Act 2A and Act 2B. For those of us who use four act structures, it's just Act 2 and 3. And we can also use something called the sequence approach, which Paul Golino wrote a book about, just a fantastic book, which takes each act, each customary act, and breaks it down into two sequences. And a sequence is usually about a dramatic question. Uh, recall that a dramatic question is about, about when a character wants something and is going after something, and then they either get it or they don't get it at the end of the dramatic question. That's the dramatic answer, essentially. And so we can split the middle of a story into two sections, 2A and 2B, and then split those each of those sections into two other sections. And those are sequences. And so the middle of a story is essentially made up of four sequences. Now these sequences, if you're going with the three-act structure, are not necessarily arbitrary. You may want to check out Paul Galina's book. I've done some posts on this as well, uh, feel free to message me and I can point you toward them. Uh, but yeah, the, the sequence approach is about structuring the story on a more modular level so that the story becomes more, it becomes clearer for writing it about what the protagonist has to do in the short term. And it also becomes clearer to the audience or the reader that the protagonist has to do this thing and I'm just following them along with this next thing, and then something happens that creates a new sequence. And so the, the audience or the reader will tend to stick with us through each of those sequences, and it's a great way to keep their interest in the short term. It's a good technique. All right, so when writing the middle of a story, finally, this is where we can talk about subplots. Because generally, if you're going to have a subplot, and you don't have to, but if you're gonna have a subplot, it goes often in the middle of a story. So subplots have three functions, according to Paul Galino. He talks about this again in the sequence approach. Uh, they have a plot function, a thematic function, and what he calls a structural function, but I wanna discuss that. So a plot function is where the subplot either helps or hinders the protagonist's journey toward the thing that they want. And it may not be directly related toward the central conflict, it, to the central conflict, but it may be something that helps or hurts them through knowledge or some relationship or some item, something like that. It, it helps or hurts. And so it's a very dramatic uh, in the sense that it affects what the character wants um, subplot. Then there's the thematic subplot, which is where we put the care, we, we offer a different approach to the theme, which generally is a different approach to the character's way of life. We show how you could live life differently. And generally this is through an influence character. An influence character is generally a character who is who will affect or influence the protagonist and make them change over the course of the story. Of course, not all characters change, not all protagonists change, and it could be the protagonist themselves who's the influence character on a community or on a society. So this influence character, we tend to follow a bit of their journey, maybe a little bit of their backstory, maybe just their relationship in particular and how it relates to the protagonist. And we see their way of life. And when we see their way of life, we automatically contrast it to the protagonist's way of life, which we set up in the first act of the story. And through that, we see why the protagonist needs to change. And it additionally gives the protagonist more reason why they need to change. Like they're interested in this other approach to life. They've never seen it before. They didn't know this was an option, but hey, it is. And this is one of the big pieces of the middle of Finding Nemo. Why can't we just have Marlin show up at uh, where Nemo is. Like, why don't we just skip that middle bit? Because we have to show Marlon's emotional journey of growth and his arc. We have to show how when he comes across a problem, how he approaches it and how Dory approaches it. Because Dory's the influence character in that story. And so we have to see how these two ways of life differ and how they uh, how they butt heads, essentially, and that's another reason why it's important to define a thematic opponent in the story.
All right, and then the third subplot is a structural subplot, which is generally to lengthen the uh, main conflict of the story, the main tension. It's to draw out the main plot so that it takes longer, thereby intensifying it. I think that's a fine, personally, I think that's a, a fine thing to do in the sense that it's a it's good to intensify the main plot. But I think if you're gonna do something like that, it should serve double duty. Like it should either help and hinder the protagonist as a dramatic subplot, or it should also have a different approach to the theme. It shouldn't just be unrelated to the drama and unrelated to the theme and just happen to delay. I, I don't think that that's the optimal way to go about constructing a subplot. So th there are those three types of subplots, although I would say effectively it may be beneficial to limit yourself to just the plot function and the thematic function for what your subplot's gonna be. And then, yeah, I mentioned that the subplot is often the protagonist and how they come up against the influence character. So that's right in the middle of a story. I mean, it's kind of short and sweet. And one of the reasons why the middle of a story doesn't get as much attention as the beginning or the end in terms of writing advice is because it's really where the story is most unique. The middle of a story is where you have the most where you can divert from any sort of traditional structure because you have that freedom and as long as you have the beginning correct and the end correct or you know correct essentially most emotionally impactful then the middle can just serve the beats that you need to hit but it, it can be much more fluid let's say but there also is this idea of sectioning and sectioning is where we just in the same way that we can use sequences to section a piece of a story by a character's desire, a sub-desire, we can also s section them by what John Truby says is time or space. And so a character is either in a location for a period of time or is going through, or we're seeing the uh, process of some time. So like the perfect day, he says. Uh, this was used in... Or is it? Uh, You've got mail, where uh, Fa <laughs> Tom Hanks's character is going through this perfect day uh, with his his niece and nephew, I think it is. So no, his uncle and aunt, I think it is. <laughs> Which is funny because they're children. So that's that's one process too. Is to is to section by the perfect day or the perfect space. Uh, it could be like the seasons changing. It could be a ritual like a wedding or a funeral. The movie Four Weddings and a Funeral, fantastic, great movie. It gets its structure, a lot of its structure, from the sectioning around ceremonies, rituals, processes, uh, which is, in this case, weddings and funerals. So a lot of structure can come from that as well, uh, sectioning in that way. All right. I'm going to call it tonight, I think, unless you all have any more questions. Uh, that's the middle of creating a story. It's fairly straightforward, but also there are a lot of different approaches depending on the story that you're writing. So if you have any question about your story in particular, please feel free to ask me. I'd be happy to brainstorm at any time. I love brainstorming story ideas. It's one of my favorite things. So uh, it's been great talking to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Feel free to message me if you have any more stories. And right in the middle of those stories, good luck with them. Thanks.